You're listening to the Novel Universe Podcast, a monthly YA Life podcast hosted by Dawn Abram and Elise Martinez, YA librarians from the Chicago land area. Each episode features reviews and rants on new and upcoming YA books. We're here to help you navigate your TBR pile. What's good, what's bad, and everything in between. I'm Dawn, the criticizer of books. And I'm Elise, the rejecter of romance. So turn up the volume. Here we go. Universe with your host Dawn, the criticizer of books. My co podcaster Elise, who is the rejector of romance, has taken an indefinite break, so it will just be me today and in the foreseeable future. Um, but that's okay because it is the most wonderful time of the year, folks, which is the best and the worst of the year. Today, I will be counting down my most disappointed reads of 2019. Next week, I will be doing my least favorites of 2019. And somewhere at the end of December, I will be counting down my favorites of the year. I am in the process of still reading books uh, that might make my list, such as The Toll by Neil Schusterman, and I have to get through uh, Children of Vice and Virtue, which those those books, those books made my list a couple years ago. So they could possibly make it again this year, so I kind of have to read those first before I make my favorites of the year. Um... As I said, it will be just me for a while. However, I don't like to podcast by myself. I find it better to be with another person that you can kind of laugh and banter. So if you are interested and want to guest podcast with me on the universe and you are an avid YA reader and you read a lot of 2019 pubs, then DM me on Instagram at Novel Universe Pod and we'll see uh, if we can get you on the podcast for our best and worst of 2019. All right. Let's get started with my most disappointed reads of 2019. So the definition of disappointed doesn't necessarily mean it's the it's bad or it's the worst book of the year. It just means that it was a really anticipated book for me or I love the author's previous work. It was very hypey by bloggers or Instagrammers and booktubers and the publishers, but it just wasn't as good as I was expecting. Or hoping. So that's what these books mean. They didn't necessarily mean that they were the worst books of the year. None of these books are on my worst books of the year. These were just the disappointed. And I'm going to rank them in order of extremely disappointing, which is number 10, to kind of disappointing, which would be number one. Oh, I said that backwards. My bad. Um, kind of disappointed is number 10. And extremely disappointed would be number one. See, if somebody else was here with me, then they would have corrected me and it would have been kind of funny. But anyway. Um... If you want to hear my full reviews of most of these books, you can listen to our older podcasts or you can read most of these. I did a review on Goodreads and you can find my full review on uh, my Goodreads account, which is uh, Bang Bang Books. All right, let's get on to the show. So number 10, most disappointed YA of 2019 was The Wicked Saints by Emily A. Duncan. I gave that book a 3.5 reluctantly. Actually, that's not true. It, it was a solid 3.5. Um, Elise and I actually did a in-depth review of this book. We did chapter by chapter. So if you want to go back and listen to our in-depth review of uh, Wicked Saints, you can go back and find our old podcast that was in April. But this book was disappointing because of all the hype that was surrounding it and... I am a person that suffers from FOMO, the fear of missing out. And if a book is super hypey, I'm going to read it. I don't care if it's not a genre I don't like, if it's a genre I don't like, if it's got awful cover, if it's an author I never heard of or don't like, if it's hypey, I'm going to read it. So that's why I chose this book to read. And uh, I thought the magic was kind of interesting with the beads. I know she had to like touch beads and she could speak to gods and stuff so I did like that I also liked how Duncan included uh our main character Nadia she was constantly questioning her faith which is not a theme you see too often in YA uh fantasy so I thought that was kind of cool however overall it just didn't quite live up to the hype and here's why uh I didn't like the main character Nadia she she was just okay I don't think that she had an original voice. She wasn't very nuanced. 
Um, it bothered me at the beginning of the book how her and her friend were pulling pranks, yet I'm supposed to believe that she is the chosen one and she's going to take down the king. Like, I don't think so. Like, I, I wasn't buying that. So the first chapter was a huge letdown as far as her character development. It just didn't make sense. I also did not like the romance between her and Malachi. I'm sorry if I'm butchering these names. I literally don't remember these characters' names. And I did, like, take notes and did research and everything, but I think his name is Malachi. Anyway, that's what we're going to call him, Malachi. Um, I didn't like their romance. I felt like she kept getting upset because he kept lying to her. And I'm reading it, and I'm like, well, fucking duh, Nadia, he's a liar. Of course, he, you don't know this man. He's going to lie to you all the time. Like, And she just kept complaining about it. And I'm like... Okay, so the two of them I didn't like, he was not very interesting until the very end of the book. He was once again, you know, reluctant leader, whatever. I'm not going to go too much into it because it's spoilers. But, you know, he wasn't a nuanced character. Seraphine wasn't a nuanced character. It was just like the characters were just okay. And then the supporting characters, um, Taraji and Rashim, I believe their names were, they didn't contribute anything to the story. I don't like it when an author throws in characters that don't drive the plot or don't aid character development. Um, I have a feeling one of them is going to die because that's what authors do. They put in these rando characters just to kill them off. Um, they're probably going to play a bigger role in the next book, but I won't be reading it. So, you know, whatever. Um, and another big thing I didn't like about this book was I love a prophecy. I love a good prophecy in a book, and I think it can make or break a book. And this book had a prophecy. But in the prophecy chapter, I just remember this witch that was reading this prophecy, and it was like a page and a half. And then Seraphin somehow remembered all of it when it was convenient. And I'm like, I don't think that's true. Like, you can't have this long-ass prophecy here at one time, and then all of a sudden oh, you remember everything. Like, that's not that's not a thing. So I didn't like the prophecy. And also didn't understand what Malachi's motives were. He, I, I wasn't, I'm not going to say because of the spoiler, but I don't understand what his motives were. And, and that was a problem. So that is why The Wicked Saints is number 10 and my most disappointed of the year. Number nine is Wilder Girls by Rory Power. And I gave this a 3.0. This was on the list because it started off really interesting. Like, I really liked it. And then it tanked. It just it just didn't go anywhere at the end of the book. I liked the feminist theme and the setting and the mystery surrounding the illness. And I liked uh, Power's writing style. I think she is a beautiful writer. And I would probably read something else by her just based on her writing style. But the reasons why it is on the list is because the pacing. The pacing was the biggest problem in the book it starts off really well it's very mysterious we don't know why they're at the school we don't know what this disease that they have the best friend goes missing she has these ominous chapters where she's like saying that she's just this awful liar which makes her a unreliable narrator which is fantastic then you have this girl and they kind of have this um, little romance among them even though she kind of hates the, the main character which was also fantastic so it was a lot of good elements working there but this book does this thing that I hate what authors do and that's when they they build up mystery and add new stuff and they add a new character with the uh, ulterior motive and then they add this other character that's shady bit shady boots and then you don't know what the hell's happening until the last chapter I don't I don't like that. I I prefer when an author drops in hints so that you can have some sort of like theory or make some predictions. You know, it makes the reading experience more fun when you are kind of contributing to it or not contributing to it, but you you can find something to keep you going. It's like some sort of like prediction or even if you're like totally wrong, it's still it's still fun to try and see if you can figure out based on the clues that the author gives you and she kind of does. You can tell this is a feminist book, but the end reveal was like, what the hell was that? I didn't see that coming at all. And it really bummed me out because I was really into the book. I was really into the writing style. I loved the friend. I can't, once again, I can't remember anybody's names. I'm sorry. 
not the main character, but her best friend that was kidnapped, her last chapter was beautiful. But the payoff was just not there. So mm, I really wanted more from this book. Didn't quite happen. So it made the disappointing list. Number eight is 10,000 Doors of January by Alex Haro. I ended up DNF in this book at 77%. So this made the disappointing list because the writing style was really beautiful, but, um, and I was kind of going off that. I saw, I always go on Goodreads to see what other people are saying before I read a book. And a lot of people were saying that the writing was very beautiful, very metaphorical, and that's my jam. I love a metaphorical um, writing style. I love a flowery language, as long as it's, making sense and not being flowery for flowers like I don't need you to expound on a tree for 10 pages like I don't need that but if it's important to the plot and the tree symbolizes something I can handle a tree a tree description for a, a paragraph or so but I read this book because of the hype and everybody was saying it was really beautiful and everything and I picked it up and this is the reason why it's on the list um Okay, so I don't think this book is YA, first of all. I think it was pushed as YA because our main character is starts off at like six or something or eight, I don't know. By the end of the book, she's still a teenager. So I think this is being pegged. It was, it was pushed as YA because of the main character's age, but it's not YA because of the writing. I am a librarian. I'm a teen librarian, and I would not know what teen to give this book to because they would be bored by chapter three. It was so slow. As an adult, I'm okay with the slow plot. I actually prefer a slow plot. But this was such a slog to get through. It was incredibly slow. And considering the fact that it is a time travel book, I believe when I DNF'd, I don't even think they really time traveled yet. Or I was just getting to it. And by then I was over it. I was like, wh where is the time travel? Like, I, it was non-existent. And maybe that's not the point, but then don't peg your book as a time travel book if you're not going to travel through time. So it was a slog to get through. There was a chapter where Haro expounded extensively on doors and the significance of doors. And it started to read like somebody's thesis paper, like their doctor doctoral paper about doors and the symbolism of door. And I'm like, don't tell me every every explanation or every symbol that the a door means you're taking away the experience of the reader to try and figure it out on their own or if you have the book as a discussion book for book club you know I I've been in book clubs I run a book club like that's that's what you want you want to be like oh my god there's a door on certain chapters and what could the door mean I don't know let's look it up what the symbolism of a door is like you talk about that and she took that away. She took that experience away from the reader, which I hated. And another thing I hated about this book, I won't say hated, but I didn't like about the book is that a Ada, Ada, I don't know how to say her name. Her chapters were told by other people's points of view and not by her own. And I found her to be a very interesting character. But to hear her story being told by randos from some interview I didn't like it especially when everybody else's point of view was a little bit better um I didn't like that Haro didn't talk about her world enough now maybe I DNF too early and she went into it later but it was clear that this took place in the very far future where nobody what okay never mind it's a spoiler but anyway, I'm not going to get into it, but her world was fascinating and I didn't get to see it or, you know, read about it. Like I said, maybe I DNF too early. I don't know. Let me know. But we have our main character, January, who is a brown person in the 20s or the 40s, 1920s, 1940s. But she's not like she's like a red brown, which is different like brown people are you know they're brown they're not red brown and so because her color was a different was off it makes her interesting but she didn't really go into where she's from enough for me at least not by 77 percent of the book um and that leads me to the discussion on race alex harrow i believe is not a black or brown person 
and she's writing about characters who are brown and our main character is incredibly lonely which I think she she conveys that quite well this girl's loneliness but her race adds an element to loneliness that Haro just did not tap into and I felt that was unfortunate and there were a lot of other black characters in this book that once again living in America in the 20s or the 40s I can imagine was shitty it's kind of shitty being black in America right now I am black by the way so the fact that we have these black characters in this book and yet race is not talked about at all to the turn of the century I mean I wasn't insulted or anything by it and I'm pretty sure she didn't want to go into it because she's not a brown person but I don't know I just felt like it would have added so much more to the story so if I go on and on about a book like that, it's because I'm really, really disappointed because it has such great potential. And I get so frustrated when I read these really good and interesting different books because I read a lot of fantasy and fantasy tends to be quite repetitive. So when I do find a book that has a fascinating world and the author can't execute it, it pisses me off. So I would probably read something else by Alex Harrow. I think she's a beautiful writer. I enjoyed her writing style. I enjoyed her characters and her world. I just wish... There was some editing done better there. All right. My number seven on my disappointed of 2019 is We Hunt the Flame by Hafsa, Hafsa Faisal. I apologize if I butchered her name. I ended up DNFing this at 80%. Um, I read this book because it was super hypey. Um, everybody was talking about it. They were giving this book away. They had booze about it. Like it was all the rage back in the spring. So, like I said, FOMO, hello, I'm going to read it. <laughs> and she's a fellow booktuber, blogger, entrepreneur. I've seen her at conferences. Of, of course, I'm going to try and read something by a fellow um, book lover in the book community. So, I like the presentation of this book as, like I said, as a black person, when you get a book about, about brown and black people, that's a fantasy. That's a huge plus because... Most most books featuring brown and black teens are contemporary books and it's always about like depressing stuff like bullying or racism or blah. but when you get in a fantasy it's like cool you know that's great I want to read about a girl who can kick ass and who's also brown um, but this book didn't quite do it for me because the main reason is because the pacing was agonizingly slow. Oh my god. Um, 80% of the book I got through and our main character still had not found the damn book. She was just going on her journey to find this fucking book and by 80% she still hadn't found the damn book and I was over it. I was over it. I, I couldn't do it anymore. So that was my major problem. It was too slow. I like a slow plot. I prefer a character driven plot over a plot driven story over action but this was just way too slow um I didn't like the romance between her and the prince and the first romance with her best friend was weird that I won't say because of spoilers um I have deal breakers when I read books there are certain deal breakers that I just I can't forgive and I will drop a rating fast as hell and one of them is called, I call the sudden epiphanies. And basically what that means is if a character has no background knowledge of a certain subject, doesn't have anybody else with them to help them, but all of a sudden they figure out where the sword is to kill the king because oh, I know, I remember some random conversation that I had a year ago with some rando homeless person. Now I remember where the sword is. No. That's what I call a random, uh, uh, a sudden epiphany. And this book was riddled with it. Our main character didn't know shit. She was by herself a lot of the time. But man, did she figure stuff out really quickly. Like, th that's a total deal breaker for me. And it happened way too often for me to forgive it. So, sorry, We Hunt the Flame. I wanted to love this book, but didn't quite. Number, what number round Six. The Merciful Crow by Margaret Owen. I gave that a 3.0. I read this book because it was hypey. And that's why I was excited about it. And the cover is beautiful. But 
Ugh. No. Um, the only thing I kinda emphasized, kinda liked about this book was the world. And by kinda, I mean I'm reaching. I had to find something because otherwise I really didn't like any of it. <laughs> I didn't like any of this book at all. And the main reasons why, I actually had a lot of reasons, but I'm not going to really go into all of them. But word choice was a problem. Reading this book was difficult. Um, you know how when you were a freshman in high school and you had to read Shakespeare for the first time in your life? And you're like, oh, what the fuck language is this? And your teacher's like, oh, it's English, dumbass. And you're like, no, it's not. It's hard to read. That's what I felt like reading this book. She would put words together that didn't go and it made it, I couldn't read it fast. Um, I'm an English major and I was a tutor. And when we would teach kids how to read, we would teach them sight words. So all you do is flashcards and sight words are words that you see very often. And the whole point of that is so that when you read, you can predict the text or you don't have to sound out sight words because you know what they you know how to pronounce them immediately. And so that's why we're able to read really fast because we know what the word is going to say. We don't have to pronounce it. We don't have to sound it out. We can predict what the text is going to say. And it allows us to read really fast. Whereas when you put words together that don't go, it stops you from reading fast and it makes you have to go back and reread and go back and try and figure out what the author's trying to say. And one could argue, well, that's a good thing because it's making you think, no, she's not, the writing isn't profound. She's just trying to make a new language, but it felt forced. And so one example I gave in my review is the main character is talking to one of the characters and she says, I don't truck with jewelry. And I'm like, I don't truck with jewelry? Is truck a verb? I, I, and I had to look it up and I'm like, okay, it just means to like carry. And I'm like, why not just say carry? Like, is, is their language or their way of speaking adding to the ambiance of the story? No, it, it's not. Just speak like a normal English speaking character. And it bothered me so much that I hated this book. I almost put this on my worst of the year, but it, I gave it a three. So it, all my worst of the years are twos and ones and zeros. So it didn't quite make that list. But so that was a big problem. Another problem I had was the prince was really I had like nitpicking stuff like the prince was really immature and I'm supposed to like root for him and be like oh he's gonna be a great king even though he can't pick up social cues like it's stupid stuff like that and then the magic system like one could drive holes through this magic system it was ridiculous it was I, I can't remember specifically what happened but one particular part that bothered me early on in the book they're traveling and they have to go up a tree because People are coming and they don't want to get found. So they go up a tree and she makes them invisible. And then later we find out that Jarvis, I don't know his name, Travis, whatever. He has his own magic where he can just like point and something like catches on fire. And I'm like, are you kidding me with this? He had this magic this whole time and you're suffering and like sweating and like praying. They don't see you up in this tree. It was, it was stupid. Like, and then I didn't understand this whole caste system. Like, why, why are you at the bottom of the caste system, yet you get rid of the plague? That's, that makes you powerful because all you have to do is say, well, I'm going to keep this nasty ass body in your village and you're all going to die or you're going to fucking pay me my money. And that's all you have to do. And like, I didn't understand how they were mistreated. And I don't believe Margaret Owen said, why the crows were so mistreated i i don't know i don't know but it bothered me so much so that it made my list enough about the merciful crow number five good luck girls by charlotte nicole davis i dnf this one at 40 percent okay so this book is on my list because the premise was great it had huge potential but the execution was awful and here is why um, Davis's world, so in this world, they live in the Old West and they are, they have, you know, different races. And of course, we all know the history of this country. Black people have not been the favorites 
among the whites forever. So in this world, blacks and whites live together harmoniously and people are discriminated because you can either cast a shadow or you cannot. Now, the laws of physics tell us that everything casts a shadow. Why these people don't cast a shadow is amazing. I, w I would like to know that. I think that's great. Um, we have, like I said, it's the Old West. They don't have technology because, you know, they, they ride horses still. However, the girls are branded and you can see their brand, I believe, through some kind of light, which means they do have some sort of technology. Cool. Where'd that come from? There are some supernatural beings are kind of like um, dementors and like half human, half creature things. That's cool. Let's talk about that. Um, there's an empire and not a government. Like, how did that happen? Like, there were so many interesting elements going on in this book. However, by 40% of the book, the author had not focused on any of that. She chose to focus on these girls who ran away from a brothel because she killed one of the main guys. Um, there's a show on Hulu or Amazon, I believe. I think it's Hulu called Harlots. That's their fucking plot. So I've seen that before and they're on the run. Of course, they have no money, so they have to rob people to get money. And along the way, they meet this guy who's like, hey, I'm handsome, I'm charming, and I'm going to help you, but you got to pay me. And of course, the main character is suspicious because why wouldn't you be? And um, let me guess, are they going to fall in love? Oh my God. Like, that's what she chose to focus on, a romance that we know is going to happen them robbing men to get money to pay for their travels. One girl is hooked on this drug and she's detoxing. Like, she didn't focus on any of the cool stuff that she set up in her book. That she info dumped, by the way, which is another deal breaker. But that's beside the point. Um, And I was like, I've read this book a million times. Why don't you talk about the stuff that's interesting and different and not about the same bullshit girls that we read in every other book? So I just DNF'd it and I was really disappointed because we got a black girl on the cover, we have black girls in the book, black men in the book, it's the old west, it's like wow this is great, let's let's do this. And yeah, nothing, nothing happened. I'm pretty sure 40% in, or after 40% things start to happen and the world gets explained. But if I'm not intrigued by the first almost half of the book, I'm over it. And that's what happened. I was over it. All right, number four is Frankly in Love by David Yoon. I gave this a three. This book was probably the most hyped YA book of this year. I went to ALA this year and they had huge banners of this book. They were giving this book away like candy. This guy has been everywhere. Super duper hypey. So, of course, I got to read it. Okay. I didn't like this book. I really didn't like this book. What I liked was the representation. Um, David Yoon is Korean, and I am not Korean. I don't know any Koreans. So, I was really interested in the culture that he put in the book, which I thought was really good. I learned a lot about Korean parents and how... Because I always wondered if other... If Asians, like Chinese and Japanese and Korean and Filipino, like, do they all get along? Like, how does that work? And turns out they don't. There's kind of like a hierarchy, which I thought was super fascinating. Um, and he does explain, explain it. They go to a Korean wedding. They go to a Korean festival. Like, he's with his family a lot. Like, it was, that part was very interesting, but that was it. Um, what I didn't like about this book is... David Yoon has been compared to John Green, and I am a lover of John Green books. I know a lot of people are not. Elise is not. <laughs> she hates John Green. I love John Green. I like his writing style. I like what he has to say. I think that it kind of gives teens some perspective on mortality and love and friendship and heartbreak and, you know, just all the good things. Um, I, I believe in, I like them because it makes teens think about life and I think that's a good thing when we live in a world of social media and why am I not getting all these likes and you know it just makes them think about something other than themselves and so I do not think David Yoon 
is the next John Green. If anything, his wife is. I think Nicola Yoon is a fantastic writer. And as a matter of fact, The Sun is Also Star is one of my favorite YA books of all time. Like her book, that book was fucking great. This book, however, I didn't like Frank. I didn't like the main character. He was kind of a whiny bitch. Like I don't, I don't understand what he was trying to be. I don't know who he was. He told these awful sex jokes all the time. And maybe it's because, because I'm not a boy and I don't know that this is how boys talk to each other. I, maybe, I don't know, but it was a little excessive. Like it got to the point where I was just like putting the book down and like taking like a couple breaths. Like, okay, I get it. Boys are gross. I, I don't need several sex jokes that are just crass, crass. And I mean, Andrew Smith's books are crass, but damn, this was just, it seemed, it seemed, it, it seemed excessive and not in a good way. Um, he, Frank, tried to be quote unquote woke with his calling smartphones fart phones, yet every time Q's sister walked in the room, her name was hot ass Yvonne. Okay. That's, that's great. Um, Frank was just not a good character. I'm trying to like really like take breaths here. Frank was just not a great character. I didn't like him at all. Um, I did not like David Yoon's writing style. I found it to be not, not extremely on the nose, but a little on the nose and there is an example so that I, I like to say in one point of the book Frank is dating Brit Brit is a Jewish girl and he's he likes her um kind of but I think he likes her just because he it's a girl that likes him back and he's excited about that which is nothing wrong with that but he's developed a friendship with Joy his Korean friend and he's talking to Joy on the phone and when Brit walks in the room he like closes his phone and to the reader Frank says I don't want Brit to know I'm talking to Joy fucking duh I know you don't want Joy I know you don't want Brit to know you're talking to Joy why does the writer need to tell me that you don't need to tell me that I don't like that I don't like it when authors don't trust the reader to infer it's infuriating it's dumbing it down and he didn't do it a lot but that type of writing separates him from a John Green style of writing because John Green don't tell you shit you got to figure it out you got to figure out why this girl is looking up in the sky and noticing that the tree branches are breaking up the sky and how that relates to her dead father's phone that's up for you to figure it out and that was in turtles all the way down in my team my team book club had an extensive conversation about that like and so David Yoon has to tell us this minor thing that we can infer. It, I know I'm like going on my soapbox about it, but like little stuff like that really bothered me. And this book had such potential because we have a kid who has incredibly racist parents and they're not white. And a lot of people think that brown people cannot be racist, but they can. And David Yoon has this opportunity to talk about having racist parents and dealing with that. And he kind of does it, but it doesn't quite do what I would have wanted to do. Like Hannah has been kicked out of her family for dating a black man, marrying a black man. And here he is wanting to date a Jewish girl and he can't. Let's talk about that. You, he confronted his parents. Great. But there were so many other elements going on in this book that were perfect opportunities to have this discussion. Like his father owned a store, a liquor store in a brown and black community, which a lot of Koreans do, by the way. My beauty supply shop is owned by Koreans. And that is a huge sore spot in the black community because a lot of black people feel like Asian people are taking advantage and taking all of our money, yet they follow us around in the store. Like that's a that's a huge problem. It's not a huge problem, but it's a big enough problem that not a lot of people know about that could have been tackled in the book. And it was an afterthought because David Yoon decided to throw these like big old bombs on us that I felt like 
was like too, too many big bombs. Like, I'm not going to say because they're spoilers, but I'm like, okay, where the hell did that come from? Like, it was just coming out of nowhere. And I felt like it was emotional warfare, warfare. I felt like it was just trying to elicit a cry. I love a good cry in a book, but I am not about that. If you're trying to force me, I can kind of see it coming. I didn't like it. I read David Yoon's acknowledgments at the end of the book. I understand why he did it, but it was too much. So that was probably my biggest issue. I felt like the writing was forced and that there were so many things that he could have done with the story that he just didn't do for me. So there we go. That's all I have to say about that book. I've said enough. All right. Number three. We're getting to the top three. Oh, boy. Yeah, my top three. Okay, number three is On the Come Up by Angie Thomas. Excuse me while I bust out my Goodreads because I had lots to say and I was not going to type it in my notes because I had a lot to say and I didn't want to type it all out. So I put this on my list because I liked The Hate You Give. I didn't love it. I think I gave it like a four to five. Um... I don't even think it made my favorites of that year. I don't know. It may have. But what I liked about The Hate You Give was the characters. Angie Thomas wrote some really strong characters, particularly Star's father, I thought was a great character, and her mom too. And I was kind of expecting another story about a girl with a kind of a close-knit family who has dreams, and there's a specific issue that's happening in her life that is troublesome for her so I was kind of expecting a different character but similar writing style similar themes similar issues which I'd be fine with but that's not what I got so what I got was I would call this a starter book and by that I mean I would give this to a teen who's never read a book before I would not give this to my teen book club that are getting 30s on their ACT tests and are getting scholarships to Ivy League schools and are in AP classes and getting 4.0s or, you know, higher than 4.0s on the GPA. Like, I would not give this book to those kids because they would be bored by it. I would give this to a kid who is not a big reader, but they see, you know, somebody who possibly looks like them on the cover or somebody who's into music and they're into music or somebody who has to be bussed to um, a white school and they're not white or you know whatever like I would give that to that kid who doesn't read I would not give this book to a reader whereas the hate you give I would because the hate you give had a lot of things going on in there a lot of great themes that you could pick apart and really have a good discussion this book you could not so I think well I had several issues with the book one of my biggest issues was that I think Thomas was trying to do too much. As the kids at my library say, girl, you're doing too much. And she was doing too much. We have our main character who wants to be a rapper, but her mom has lost her job, so she can't pay the bills. And she likes her friend, and he doesn't like her back. And her other friend is gay, but he's secretly dating a guy. And she gets a bus to a predominantly white school. And there's an incident at the school, and her aunt's in a gang, and his her brother can't find a job even though he has a college degree and her father was murdered by a gang member and her mom used to be hooked on drugs and her grandma's an asshole like that is a lot she is trying to jam into a 400 page book if that I just want her to take a couple of those things and focus on them and when she has all this stuff crammed in her book there were some things that were important that were left out particularly the incident that happened at school she was basically profiled by the school officer he he threw her down and like claimed that she had a weapon or drugs or something I can't remember that's a huge that's a huge deal that's a huge thing that's happening right now where teens are just being profiled because of their race and they're not doing anything but she doesn't really have a chance to go into it because she has all this other shit that she has to wrap up that really don't contribute much to the plot um so that was a huge problem I thought the themes in this book were really dumbed down. So where we had Star who was grappling with 
living a double life essentially where she has to be hood to her black friends but then she has to be white and perfect and sweet to her white friends and she got this white boyfriend and she kind of hides her white boyfriend and you know like she's kind of living this double life and that's a big theme whereas this book we have Brie who she kind of holds all her anger in because she doesn't want to cry because crying is weak are you fucking kidding me with that theme really that's where we're going with that with this book we can do better than that Angie Thomas come on like that theme was lame um I'm trying to see what else do I say in my review I just didn't think it was critical enough like and that's why I call it a starter book everybody knows that people who don't like to cry they they consider it to be weak but it's not necessarily weak like that theme is prominent in YA, YA books and it's just not, that's a starter theme. It's not a theme that you can really sink your teeth into and really have a good discussion about it. The characters in this book were not great. Like, I didn't even like Brie because she was kind of, she was kind of a bitch. Like, and she was kind of selfish. Like, I'm not going to really go into it. And that really wasn't my biggest problem as far as she, her character development was concerned. But I felt like her best friend Trey and I think he was the one that was gay. I don't know, maybe not. Anyway, that's not the point. My point is that her brother was an underused character. This is a man who has a college degree, yet he delivers pizza. But he is so positive. He's just like, you know what? This is just a bump in the road. I'm still going to work hard. That was a great theme that was info dumped. Like, that would have been a great discussion to have among kids who think that because you get a college degree that you're automatically successful and you know we have a lot of teens or kids right now who have a college degree that are working at the mall and I think that her brother had some great things to say about that situation I was one of those kids working at the mall with a master's degree so you know she could have gone somewhere with that she didn't um Okay, another thing that bothered me <laughs> with this book is Brie is supposed to be this aspiring rapper and she is like really excited. She gets a, a, a record deal and, and actually I'm wrong. She's not really excited. Like there's so much going on with this book that when she does get a, 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 a music deal, she's just like, yay, music deal. All right, my aunt's in a gang now and my mom's on drugs and you know, <laughs> it's like, okay. This book is supposed to be about her being, going on the, you know, getting her come up or whatever you want, however you want to say it. But she didn't even focus on that. And then when we did hear her rhymes, they were not great rhymes. I'm like, this is supposed to make you an amazing lyricist? I'm going to go with hell no. And I was laughing. I was laughing at her rhymes. I shouldn't be laughing. I should be like, yeah, girl, yeah, yeah. And it was just like, no, girl, no, no. So... I thought that was a little laughable. I was really disappointed in this book, clearly, because I keep talking about it. The more I talk about the book, the more disappointed I am in it. I was just so disappointed because, you know, I thought Angie Thomas did a really good job with The Hate You Give. And this one, I don't know, maybe she had to be the deadline. Maybe they were like, ooh, girl, we need to make more money off you. Crank it out. And she was just like, okay. I mean, I, I don't know the circumstances, but her sophomore book was just, ooh, not great. All right. Let me move on to number two. My number two book was Rain and Delilah's Midnight Matinee by Jeff Zentner. I gave this three, a reluctant three, but oh geez. Okay, so this book was disappointing because I love Jeff Zentner. I loved The Serpent King. I make teens read it all the time, even though it doesn't suck because that book, that cover is god awful. So teens don't check it out. Um... It was amazing. And so therefore, I like Zentner. I like his writing style. And so I wanted to read subsequent books. Goodbye Days was okay. I didn't hate it. It was just okay. It wasn't the level of um, The Serpent King, but nonetheless. But this book, oh boy, this book was awful. It was so bad. And it's on the list because it was, okay, let me, first let me start by what I like about the book. I try to start with what I like. So I like the themes that he was trying to go with here. 
um, we have these two girls. One is got a very, you know, she's got a mother and a father and a younger sister, and she's got a very strong support group. Her parents really care about her, and they want her to go to college, and they're trying to help her be her best. And then we have another girl. Uh, I don't remember which is which. I think it's Delilah. Delilah is a single mom. Her mom is on medication. I believe she's bipolar or depressed or something. And Delilah has to, you know, help take care of her mom. Her father abandoned her when she was younger. She's not college bound. And they have this this show on cable access where they talk about like um um old B rated B rated um horror flicks. And this is all Delilah has. But she knows Rain is going to go away to college. And it's sad. And I think that happens a lot with teens. When you turn, you know, when you're 18 and you're a senior in high school and you and your little tight knit group, tight knit group of friends, not everybody's going to the same college. You might be going to a different colleges. Maybe you're not going to college and they are and you feel like a piece of shit or, you know, circumstances happen. And a lot of books don't talk about that. And I think that he tried to do something with it, which was great. He also talks about parents. And even though we don't all have two parents who are perfect and have great jobs and are eating dinner with us at home every night doesn't mean they don't care. Like everybody's parents are different and they still love you and that's great. Even though you have one parent or two parents or four parents, whatever. Like your parents, if your parents are there to support you, then they love you. That's a good thing. You should hold on and be grateful for that. So I do, I did like what he was trying to go for, but the execution was fucking bonkers so these two girls go to this this convention and while Delilah's off finding her father which was fine like her going off to find her father that part of the story was fine because this is when she kind of comes to realize you know I'm not going to say it's too much of a spoiler but anyway Rain goes off with her MMA boyfriend fighting boyfriend and they go on this wild goose chase with this guy that they're trying to collaborate with and it is so over the top. I know it's meant to be funny, but in my opinion, Jeff Zentner cannot do funny. I think he's a funny person. I've seen him in person. I think his Instagram is great and his Twitter is great, but he can't write humor. I don't think he writes humor well, and it showed in this book. It was not funny. It was over the top, and I could not suspend enough belief that this is what was happening at this convention. I just couldn't do it. And it just became a farce. So I need Jeff Sentner to write in his lane what he's good at, which is like depressed teens, bully teens, teens with shitty parents. Like that's what he needs and teens with great parents. Like that's what he needs to focus on. Let's hope his next book goes back to that lane because that's where the Zents shines. Okay, number one, my number one disappointed book of 2019. And this hurt my feelings so much. I was so upset by this book. I didn't even finish. I had to DNF at 70%. And that is King's Bane by Claire Legrand. I love Fury Born. Fury Born, I believe, was my number three book of last year or the year before. I can't remember. That book was like great. I personally loved it. I I wouldn't say I compared it to Game of Thrones, but I think she had a very interesting world on her hands where we have a girl who's in the future and we have a girl who's in the past and we're like reading the story out of order and we have a prologue and we find out what happens at the end of this story well like well not the end the middle of the story but we have to work our way to the middle of the story like that's fucking great I was all about that there was violence and sex and all kinds of great stuff in book one and in book two was just a convoluted hot ass mess I was so confused by everything and Riel oh my god so she has to find these horcruxes that's gonna call them horcruxes because I don't know 
to stop the end of the world. And so she like goes to the monks or whatever and is like, I need to find these damn poor crocuses. And we're like, oh, well, we're not going to help you, even though it would make the stopping of the end of the world faster. You know, we're, we're going to we're going to make you look for them on your own, even though Corian and the other bad angels are breaking through the gate and they're going to kill us all pretty soon. But we have all the information yet. We're not going to tell you. OK, OK, Dumbledore. That's great. Okay, so then they're like, oh, you know what, psych? We are going to tell you. I was kidding. We're going to tell you. Oh, no, no, we're not going to tell you. Sorry, we're not going to tell you. Meanwhile, she's banging Audric. She's banging Lou Devine. And Corian comes in. Oh, Corian. Oh, God, I can't resist Corian now. It's like, oh, my God. I can't, I can't with this book anymore. As you can hear my voice, I was very upset about this book. I wanted to love it. I met Claire Legrand at ALA, and I was excited. And... I can't read book three. I'm over it. I'm over it. It had such potential. And I just, I, I died a little bit inside after I DNF this book at like 70%. I read it all the way to 70% and didn't bother to finish. And I honestly don't remember what happened. Like I'm struggling to even try to remember where it left off because, or what happened in the 70% that I read. And I couldn't, I can't tell you. So yeah. That's my top 10 disappointed books of the year. Um, like I said, they weren't the worst of the year. Just books that I wish were better. That I thought were going to be great and they weren't. I would love it if you could tell me some of your most disappointed books of the year. And if some of these books on my list were your favorites. Sorry, not sorry. You know, we all have opinions like assholes. Sorry, not sorry. Um, but I would love to hear what your disappointed books of the year are. Remember... Although this has been fun, I do like to talk with other people in the podcast. So if you're interested and want to podcast with me, with your worst of the list or your best of the list, DM me at Novel Universe Pod. And we're back to the shitty outro. That's all I got. And I'll see you next week. <laughs>